chicks. This owl thing is for real. One of them swooped down and took one of their little teacup dogs they had outside. Oh, no. Ran off with it. Never saw it again. Ah. Yeah. Oh. That is some, some Planet Earth 3 business going on there. It's just a okay. rude bird. Here we Owls. see the innocent. What they see. Wait, and this is the daytime? I thought owls were nocturnal. That's where they got those big eyes. Well, that's, that's why they swooped down and, and, and took the dogs. They're so upset that everyone was keeping them up in the day. Yeah, see? It's all a sleep thing. It always comes back to sleep and lack of it. You know what? Maybe I, they saw, maybe they freak out. So I got to test my soundboard here. All right, good. It's working. Maybe they saw so many of those Taco Bell commercials, they thought they were getting like a quesarito or something. Oh, I've had a quesarito before. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't taste like that little toy dog. <laughs> hey, uh, I know we had to cut short the uh, the uh, post show yesterday uh, because I, I was hitting the road, uh, but it was worth it. I went up to the Comedy Film Nerds uh, new studio up in Burbank. Uh, I actually passed right by the Overwatch uh, location as well, nice. Scott. Nice. And uh, it, it was it was a blast. We talked about Ready Player One. Uh, we talked about the Isle of Dogs. Uh, talked about a couple trailers. I even uh, uh, talked about Wizard of Oz in their in their special uh, after show thing for their patrons. Nice. Uh, so uh, check it out, Comedy Film Nerds. I was on there with Graham and Chris, and it was a blast. It was really fun. We're gonna have Chris on DTNS actually, not too long from now. At the last week of this month. Last week of this month. So yeah, turnabout is fair play. Oh, turnabout used to be one of our school dances where the girls asked the boys, "Get it?" Oh, uh, like going about. Back. It was very stressful. We had a uh, youth reform company that would take troubled kids who were into drugs and stuff and take him out in the wilderness and try to scare him straight. And that was called turnabout. <laughs> That's a totally <laughs> different use of Wait, that it word. Was, it's it's one of those weird boot camps where they make a march to the desert. Turnabout is not fair play in this case. <laughs> All right. Uh, you guys ready? Yep. Yeah, I think so here uh, we go. The Daily Tech News Show is brought to you by its global listener base, not outside organizations. To find out how you can contribute, go to dailytechnewsshow.com slash support. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, April 4th, 2018 from DTNS headquarters in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. From beautiful uptown Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. You're so uptown. You're an uptown girl. Uh, also with us, our producer, Roger Chang. How are you, sir? I am fine. I just watched uh, The Last Jedi last night. Who says Roger's behind the times? He's up on all the latest Star Wars. Always. Movies, you know. Six months later. All right, folks, uh, we are going to try to uh, keep our spirits up uh, for a show that is going to be a bit of a downer, uh, but it's something I, I think we need to talk about. So we'll start with a few tech things you should know. San Bruno, California police identified 39-year-old San Diego resident Nazim Agdam as the person who shot and wounded three people at YouTube headquarters Wednesday before shooting and killing herself. Agdam had previously posted plenty of videos complaining about YouTube, censoring her and demonetizing her channels. And we're going to be delving into this in a lot more detail a little bit later in the show. Intel announced it will not provide Spectre variant two fixes for some older chips. Kind of knew this was coming. New, uh, no core two chips will get fixes and all the fixes for core chips have already been released. Owners of Sandy Bridge or newer systems will get fixes, but others should check the Intel site to see if their chip is indeed I mean, supported for a fix. Intel had said they were going to fix all of them. So this is a change. They're like, mm, oh, I actually, they, no. I, I, you know what? I guess I never heard him say that, but I always assumed something was going to get lost. You can't go back forever and do yeah. my 486, you know? So I don't know. Tinder is testing its first video feature called Tinder Loops. Not a breakfast cereal. It's a Tinder feature. Uh, it's only on iOS in Canada and Sweden right now as a test. Feature is a two-second long repeating video that can be added to a user's profile. <laughs> hey, if you want to swipe right on anything... <laughs> Two second loop. All right. <laughs> Tinder Let's all loop. move to Canada. Or Part of this complete dating strategy. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit more about a good old fashioned Apple rumor. What do we got? Well, first of all, you should, DTNS should now be in two second GIF format. <laughs> That's our new yes from now on. A great idea. Uh, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman reports that sources say Apple is researching touchless gesture control 
and curved screens as potential features in future iPhones. The features are at least two years away and are not guaranteed to end up in the products. So like all Apple rumors, who the crap knows till they release them. German's pretty good with this stuff. Uh, but this we're not saying that he's wrong when you say that. We're saying what he's saying is Apple's researching this. Apple researches all kinds of things. So do a lot of companies. Some things don't pan out and they don't use them. Uh, I would guess that the curved phone, the curved screen, since there is a bit of a curvature in the current iPhone screen, uh, is probably likely to be figured out. I don't know why I want it. I'm curious what Apple comes up with for a reason, but it's certainly doable. Yeah. The touchless gesture thing, I've heard rumored before. This is the most reliable uh, report on it that I've heard. That one, if they can make it work, I totally get. You know, the ability to just kind of wave your hand at the screen and have it do things not only is cool but also increases a lot of accessibility options yeah i i'm so skeptical of the touchless thing but only because i'm i'm having a hard time picturing the use cases where i would be waving at my phone and not looking like a complete weirdo uh but there i'm sure there are cases like for example it'd be nice for some people who want to hold their phone out to here and just sort of wave here when they want to flip screens or change pages uh, maybe that's the kind of stuff we're talking about. Well, think of but, before the show, Scott, you were talking about how smudgy your phone was. Yeah, think, think of how many fewer smudges you might have once you get used to the touchless thing. And maybe the curved screen and touchless have something to do with each other, a little mm -hmm. bit more of like an encompassing okay. so that your edges are a little bit closer to you and it can read what you want a little well, bit more. Easily. How, how, do you feel about, how do you feel about a future where... We've been told for the last, you know, 10 plus years that touch was it. Touch was the thing. Touch is going to be there forever. Can you see a future where we don't touch our interfaces? I mean, maybe it's always there as a backup, but. Well, really we're talking to them now without touching them. So sure. It's true. Not well, but yes. And it can read our face. So eventually facial expressions could be used. Yeah. It's, a, it's when like you, you start realizing your head and it moves to the next one. Time's going so fast because it just seems like I was just barely told that touch was going to be it forever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing lasts forever. The only constant is change. Speaking of changes, John Gian Andrea is stepping down from his post as Google Head of Artificial Intelligence. He's been there for two years. Google engineering executives Ben Gomez and Jeff Dean will take over the department in joint roles. Google initially indicated, this was yesterday's news, that Gian Andrea would stay with the company, but it appears that is not the case because he's headed to Apple to head Apple's machine learning and AI strategy and will report directly to CEO Tim Cook kind of a big job. Gian Andrea once worked at Apple's spinoff General Magic, so he probably has some friends there. He joined Google when it bought MetaWeb, where at the time Gian Andrea was CTO. You know, it's funny when, when I read the story yesterday, I thought, gosh, you know, maybe he didn't do a good job because Google was very vague, like, yeah, he'll continue to work on, you know, just kind of engineering stuff. That's, that's what he does best. Mm -hmm. Clearly they knew that this, this story had, had what? it. That that Second I know chapter. this is the main part of this story is Apple stepping up their AI game, right? Like they they've been criticized for falling behind with Siri, and this is stealing one of the best from the best uh, at AI. I know that's the main story, but there is a part of me that wants to know why would Google even say he's sticking around? They had to have known he was leaving. Well, you would think it's a big enough position that you'd think they'd know, or didn't but, they? Well, or but didn't but they, they also they they give precious few details about what he was going to be doing. You know, was it a demotion? Was it, you know, it, you know, was he you know, not a good leader? Was he not a good manager? Is he just better, you know, tinkering in the lab? And I think that that was just Google's way of having something to say, knowing that he was actually leaving. Well, I feel like if he was actually leaving, you just don't say anything. You just say he's stepping down and leaving the company. That's what usually happens when somebody goes to the competition. Say, making a point of confirming that he'll be sticking around only to have it overturned later in the day just seems weird to me. Sure. I mean, at the 11th hour, if Apple, you know, scooped him up and Google's like, well, okay, well, I guess you're leaving. Uh, well, that would be a whole different twist. No, that's, I guess that's the interesting part is did John and Drea not tell them? What was the deal not finalized with Apple until later that day? Was he leaving without going anywhere and Apple found out and like made him an offer he could refuse? I doubt any of those things are true. I'm sure it was just a weird mix up where the person making the statement didn't realize that like, no, he's not sticking around, dude. <laughs> you, you told him the wrong thing. That's probably the most likely. But anyway, yeah, uh, a big get for Apple in AI. And it shows their commitment to that as a vertical, having him report to Tim Cook. I think there's 11 people who report to Tim Cook. So they're all part of things that are extremely important for Apple.
Yeah, and they need to fix Siri. You mentioned it before. Siri's lagged behind. Even strident Apple fans like myself think Siri is kind of <laughs> a, a bad deal right now. So I, I hope this uh, sheds light on how Siri is going to work out in the future. U.S. Senator Ron Wyden wrote a letter to the U.S. Department of Home Sec- Homeland Security uh, asking about unauthorized use of stingrays. The DHS has now responded, saying it has observed what it calls anomalous activity involving Stingray mobile phone interceptors. If you don't know, Stingrays are a device that can be used to mimic mobile phone towers, and then they collect all the information of the cell phones they can get. Uh, They may be only after one particular cell phone, but they collect a wide amount of data because they trick every cell phone in the vicinity into connecting to them. That's why they are very controversial for use by not only the government, but local police forces, local governments, etc. And uh, DHS not really shedding a lot of light by like, yeah, we have noticed those. Isn't that weird? Uh, in the, they're right in the capital area. Must be those spies is not what they said, but it's kind of the implication. Mm, I don't like these. These freak me out. I don't like that they're called stingrays. I don't like anything about, anything <laughs> about the story. Freaks me out. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to uh, this story about Facebook. I know you guys have heard a lot of Facebook stuff lately, folks, but here is the ultimate catch up. I think Facebook CTO Mike Schrofer says this, this is a quote, Facebook information. And he's talking of up to 87 million people worth. Most in the U S may have been improperly shared with Cambridge Analytica by apps that they are friend, or sorry, that they or their friends have used. Facebook will start informing affected users April 9th as part of a banner that will help all users understand which apps have access to their data. Facebook also announced new restrictions on what data third parties can access through the Facebook API. For instance, apps will no longer get ideological information like religious or political views. Uh, Schrofer also said Facebook will limit what Android data it collects when users opt in to improve friend recommendations and will delete call logs older than a year. Uh, that's kind of a mouthful, but in other Facebook developments. Actually, any comments on that first, Tom? No, I was going to say, but wait, there's more. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely more. Um, there's other stuff going on. The company has posted a written version of its terms of service, and this is the rewritten version. This is them going and changing it and showing it to you. They're going to take comments for seven days, seven full days before asking its users to accept these new rewritten terms. Uh, so you got a brand new EULA to read, everybody. Get out there and do it. Mark Zuckerberg will testify before the U.S. House Committee on Energy and Commerce at 10 a.m. Eastern time on April 11th. So that's coming up. And in an interview with Reuters, Zuckerberg said uh, he would not commit to extending all of the EU's general data protection regulation practices outside of Europe. I bet that question comes up again in the Congress. Uh, maybe, maybe. We don't re- usually get to do it quite this, this way. Uh, but breaking news, TechCrunch says that Mark Zuckerberg has refuted that very Reuters report. And I just found this at the second, Scott. Oh, gosh. Uh, this this right. came across the feed. Uh, he, the, he says, I think regulations like the GDPR are very positive. We intend to make all the same controls available everywhere, not just in Europe. It's going. Is it going to be exactly the same format? Probably not. We'll need to figure out what makes sense in different markets with different laws in different places. But let me repeat this. We're going to make all the same controls and settings available everywhere, not just in Europe. So I think it's a case where he was saying, well, you know, implementing it the way we're doing it in Europe probably could run afoul in some small way of the way you're supposed to phrase something in the United States. So we'll change the phrasing or, you know, we may have to lump a couple of things together or certain export uh, data may be restricted in, in Thailand uh, where it's not in the Europe. And in fact, in Europe it's required and we'll make those adjustments. Uh, and so he's now trying very hurriedly in this press conference that's going on right now to say, we know folks don't get mad at us about GDPR. We are going to implement this everywhere. Yeah. I, I, I'm very curious about the actual, uh, energy and commerce session that happens on the 11th. And I don't know, I assume that's public. Can we all watch it? It's going to be huge, right? Oh yeah. No, it'll be on C-SPAN and probably carried by a bunch of other live streams. Yeah. Yeah, I I was on Facebook and it gave me one of these like, Hey, you've been selected to participate in one of our user surveys. And I thought, Oh, it's an analytical one. All right. It wasn't, it was about, Hey, do you ever 
I don't know, find cleaning, uh, you know, services <laughs> online? And if so, have you ever gone through Facebook? But when we talk about terms of service and the fact that people don't read EULAs and a, a vast majority, no matter, you know, how, how it's rewritten, will also not read this, even if required, people just sort of say, yes, 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 take me to my timeline. I wonder if there is a way to force somebody to take it in more of a survey form to hmm. make it more natural language so that there is less of that, well, nobody reads that stuff anyway. It's just a bunch of legal speak. I, I don't know what that would look like. Yeah. You know what? That's, That's a, really a great idea. idea. That's an awesome idea. Here's how it needs to work. It's like when you go get a house loan. You get these stacks of paper, and what you have hopefully is a trusted individual there, your agent, whoever, who is saying, all right, well, that basically this page that's nine pages long and is horrible to read means this. So you're signing, when you sign this, what you're saying is basically you're going to approve this. Give give that kind of guidance through a kind of step-by-step -step quiz service. I think that's a brilliant idea. Because to be clear, this rewritten terms of service doesn't change the policies. It's just changing the way they explain them so that it's clearer. What could be clearer than making sure people understand before they move on? Annoying as hell, right? Because we all want to save that time and just skip by saying okay. Um, but that's that's a fantastic well less idea. less oh. annoying that than data being used for possibly nefarious purposes without anybody understanding what's really going on. Yeah, I love yeah. that. Idea. Definitely the lesser of two evils. Or okay. at least you know how they're supposed to be using it. Yeah. Exactly. Or, 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 you know, it, it, it's the company taking uh, uh, larger steps to, to, to really try to inform people of, of what's, what's going on behind the scenes. This is a great story, guys. This is, this is, this really cheered me up today because Google is building another undersea cable running 6,000 miles to connect Japan to Guam and then Guam to Australia. It's a lot of fiber. The G JGA, as it's going to be called, will connect with the Hong Kong, Singapore, Australia cable to build a ring that covers the Asia Pacific region. Now, Google has found it more cost effective to build its own undersea cables than to rent time on existing cables. Sounds sort of familiar, Google does this. It also has direct investment in 11 other undersea cables. Now, these are one of these engineering marvels where I just say like, the sea floor, how do you get down there? I mean, it's that's crazy, especially since if you read a little bit about how these cables are not only constructed, but you know these are years-long projects. They have to be constructed in factories, and then the cables are 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 designed to withstand. I don't know. Not only sea life, who even knows what's going on down there? But currents, um, and you know, living on an ocean bed for years, and then ships have to 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 drop the cable, which is apparently made of very very. Um, uh, strong glass, you know, that's that's built to not break. Although it happens sometimes. Then when it breaks, a ship has to go back out there and fix it in a certain area. I don't know. I mean, it's sort of like every time I used to cross the Golden Gate Bridge, which was twice a day at one point, I'd be like, how do they do this? How does it not fall? You know, I, I know it. I know how it works, but it's still uh, sort of a miraculous thing to me. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating stuff. Tom, Tom um, quickly, I want to play upon your your sci-fi writership here. You need to make a book about undersea cities where we all live like Gungans because it's already been pre-wired and piped for internet. This is the next step into undersea cities. I'm telling you. Misa, get right on that. Yeah, as long as we have internet, let's, I mean, who needs air? What else do you need? Yeah. You know, you know that there's no, like you'd have to splice into those cables just like you do on land. It's not being undersea doesn't help anyway. Or um, do you? To get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to Daily Tech Headlines at dailytechheadlines.com. All right, folks. Uh, as we mentioned, San Bruno police identified the shooter on the YouTube campus. Uh, we've had a day to sort of find out what really happened or at least know a little more than we did yesterday when we mentioned it on the show. Uh, as Sarah mentioned at the top of the show, 39-year-old San Diego resident Nassim Ogdam uh, was the person who shot and wounded three people at YouTube headquarters Wednesday before shooting and killing herself. One of the victims is still listed in critical condition. Police say that Ogdam's primary motive was frustration with, and this is a quote from the police, the policies and practices of YouTube. Uh, so the police are considering that her motivation. Ogdam had previously posted videos complaining about YouTube, a telegram post complaining about YouTube. Uh, she said they were censoring her. They were filtering her. They had uh, made one of her videos uh, age restricted. She took exception to that. They demonetized her channel and her family had reported her missing and police found her on Monday night in Mountain View the night before the shooting 
but they didn't know she was going to shoot anyone. There was no reason to detain her. She's an adult. So they informed the family. We found her. She's in Mountain View. And her father told police she might be headed to YouTube because of her anger at demonetization of her channel. Uh, San Bruno Police Chief Ed Barberini told the press Wednesday that Ogden visited a gun range Tuesday morning before the shooting. The family was not aware that she owned a gun. Her YouTube channels and Facebook and Instagram accounts have been taken offline. Uh, last we looked, the Telegram account was still there. There may There's a website as well. Um, there, there's a lot of hacking involved with this. I don't even know if we want to get into that, maybe if we have a little time at the end. But uh, the biggest issue here to me, to my mind, and I'm curious what Sarah and, and Scott think, uh, is this is a, a, an extreme example of the culture of outrage against platforms. Some of what YouTube does is wrong, uh, is exploitative, and is mistaken. Some of what YouTube does is just random. Uh, it's just accidental. Mm -hmm. uh, we get demonetized every day. Every DTNS video on YouTube gets demonetized often before it's posted because something's weird in the YouTube system. And Roger kvetches about it because he has to go in and report it and then it gets unblocked, et cetera, and we're fine. But uh, my personal YouTube channel has been demonetized because I don't meet the new, more stringent uh, system. It is not uncommon for people to be angry at YouTube, but it has created a culture uh, that has led this person to have an extreme reaction. What YouTube's done doesn't justify this. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, but it is... I think significant that YouTube is now in the class of local television stations, local radio stations, newspapers, which have all for a long time had very strict security policies because newscasters have been shot. Reporters have been shot in the past. That stopped. Uh, that largely does not happen anymore, but it was a more common occurrence in the early days of broadcasting. We're at that point with YouTube now. Yeah. I mean, I, we talked about this briefly on TMS this morning. Uh, and I've thought a lot about it since, um, given what we talked about. And I more than even then believe that what we are seeing is, uh, the internet and its institutions, uh, it's things we're used to, uh, the Facebooks and the YouTubes of the world and, and Twitters of the world. We're seeing them become so interwoven with just regular society. In fact, they just straight up are regular society. We talked this morning about how the internet is no longer kind of this separate entity from regular life, the way it kind of used to feel in the late 90s and maybe early aughts. It's now just all part of the same fabric. And so as a result of that, that maturation, I think that you start to see some of these things happen like they do in lots of walks of life. Uh, like you see happen at public libraries. There was a time when a public library wasn't a thing that was very common, but now it is. And so as things become more institutionalized or a better word would be more interwoven with our regular lives, we start to see both good and bad things happen that just kind of happen. And, it, and, and it's sticking out to us big time because of the tech angle and where we're all coming from for our perspective and a lot of people like us. But I think overall, it's just another step toward this is life is them. They are us. We are them. And there's no real distinction anymore. They're not just some hobby off to the side with a weird computer I run. Yeah. I think YouTube as a platform, um, the fact that there are millions of users, many of them might consider YouTube their livelihood or part of it. Uh, not everyone, uh, but, uh, you know, a growing number of users who express outrage all the time. It's very hard for me to separate that from well, and, and then, you know, you might be mad enough that something like this happens. There's no excuse for something like this happening. It's, 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 it's completely wrong and no amount of outrage could justify what happened yesterday. However, the greater of numbers uh, of users you have, the more likely, especially when there is not only money involved, but someone cons uh, who considers themselves being censored and or ignored, uh, that is something that companies are going to have to come to terms with. And I, you know, I, I hate to say this, but this is, this is not, not the last time this sort of thing happens. The fact that the campus, uh, which is in San Bruno, which I have never been to personally. Um, but you know, I, I, I've known a lot of people who've worked there over the years and you know, it's sort of large and it was lunchtime and there were people outside. That angle of it is really troubling to me because 
there are a lot of, especially in Silicon Valley, but certainly in other places as well, you know, these big sprawling campuses where it's, you know, it's supposed to be sort of like a utopia to work there, the Google campus, the Apple campus, there's, you know, there are a lot of examples of this. And the idea that an employee working for a, a company like YouTube would be unsafe because there might be somebody who is angry with YouTube for whatever reason it is, you know, this is a specific reason, but it, it could be a lot of reasons who could have access to hurt somebody who works there. I wonder how companies are going to have to lock down and protect themselves I, going forward in the same way that a school would. I think in some ways, uh, these companies, because they've, they've broadened out what you were saying, Sarah, about having larger, uh, a larger clientele and a larger user base, as you broaden out to society, you tend to cross over into a lot of the strata that they might have not had before because the user base might have been smaller. And the one parallel I see is with celebrities in the same way that as celebrities become more um, recognizable, uh, more popular with a wider group of people, they have to be more careful about their personal safety. In fact, you know, many studio lots, I'm, I'm sure you're well aware, have very tight security for that reason because they don't, even if someone is there for a genuinely benign reason, they need to take that extra precaution because it all, it, all it takes is one or two individuals to kind of really, uh, uh, you know, make it a, a very, you know, at least feeling very unsafe. And, you know, that's one of those things because they are dealing with not just a product, they're dealing with, you know, a society. You, it's a different mindset than just rolling out implementations of software, of user interfaces and things like that. Yeah, it's, it's an example of the fact that these are the biggest companies in the world. Mm -hmm. You think about that, you know, it used to be U.S. Steel, used to be Exxon. Uh, you don't think those companies had incredible security. Uh, these companies, these tech companies came up from a, an area where they were somewhat not obscure, but somewhat niche. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they could afford to do these open campus ideas. And, and that's going to change. Now, I, I don't want to exaggerate that one person does not a trend make, uh, but it does require all companies to review, okay, what, what, what are they doing to protect their employees? Is there a risk of this sort of thing happening to them? And certainly in the case of the YouTube uh, campus and probably all the YouTube campuses, I, I know my, my wife used to work at YouTube here in LA. She doesn't work there anymore. This campus wasn't involved, but she said, yeah, I, I talked to my friends there and they sent people home because now everybody is worried about it. You don't, you don't think that just because you're not in San Bruno doesn't mean you're like, well, wait, it, you know, we have big YouTube sign up on the, on the side of the wall. So they, they are going to have to adapt, even if it's just to make their employees feel safe. Yeah. There's uh, even for no other reason. The only th thing I would say just to finish off my thoughts on this would be there, <laughs> there's going to be this interesting psychological uh, evaluation of this and, and probably some good, healthy discussion about our expectations of these services. It's a platform that lets you put your videos up there for free. Well, what does that mean? Are we are we supposed to have some greater access or, or should we have equal uh, volume of people looking at us as somebody who's fit more famous than us? Like, there's all these questions about, about what we're doing there that I think are gonna be interesting to talk about that are not even necessarily connected to this tragedy, but are perhaps spurred on by it. And I think that's a worth, that's a discussion worth having. Well, thanks to everybody who carries on these discussions in other arenas. Uh, our, our post show that's a, that's available. Uh, our subreddit at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com and our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. All right, let's take a look at the mailbag. Sarah? Let's do it. Dwayne in Germany, who's working for the Department of Defense, wrote in, this is really interesting, said, I just want to recap the Windows rollout that we just completed because OMG, that was hell. That's a direct quote from Dwayne. He says, Windows itself, not hell, but the process, very painful for us. I see why so many enterprise companies don't like the process. Thousands of PCs were swapped out just at our base alone because so many of the older PCs didn't properly support Windows 10. Many of them were Vista PCs, then they were upgraded to Windows 7. This was amazing undertaking for our communication squadron personnel, because that's, you know, what they've got there, and those designated to help in each squadron. Windows 10 booted up fine. Outlook 
worked fine, but drivers, printers, mm. horrible experience. As you can imagine, this is not regular windows that we're using at the Department of Defense. You can't just load a driver. The communication squadron had to do all of this themselves. So wanted to give a massive shout out to all the US Air Force, Army, Marine, and Navy comm personnel that endured the pains and tribulations of making this happen. Millions of PCs in the DOD were either replaced or upgraded and ding, they deserve some love. Yeah. Give yeah. Them some love. Good That's work. really cool, Dwayne. It's, it's it's interesting to 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 think of it on on a scale of that, especially something that's um, you know, as security uh, um, uh, reliant as as the DoD. Now, uh, yesterday uh, we read an email from John, and first of all, he says, "Sarah, sorry to give you so much to read yesterday," uh, but he followed that's up okay. on my question uh, about the the proposal uh, for for the the citizens band access that's going to be shared with the military, but. Remember, the, the carriers won't have to own it, so they can all use it. And I said, according to my reading of Google's proposal, it didn't look like it was entirely blocked when the military needed it, just deprioritized it. John says, he's not an expert either, but looking at what WinForum's working group standard says, which is what Google's working with, he says, it looks like the carriers need to vacate 20 megahertz of the 100 megahertz band when the military needs it but you you would get to use the rest of the band. So you'd absolutely need to vacate part of the band. You wouldn't just be de deprioritized, but there'd still be uh, a large amount of the band that you could continue to, to use. So uh, John says, let me know if you have any other questions. It's very strange to actually have something to contribute, but hey, this stuff is all pretty obvious after you work on it for years, which is why we love our audience because there's always somebody who's like, oh wait, I actually know about that thing. And this time it's John. Thank you, John. Yeah, strange to you, John, but great for us. The hive mind continues. Also great for us is having Scott Johnson on the show each week. Scott Johnson, thank you. And let folks know where they can keep up with your other work. Well, uh, big stuff coming soon on the Kickstarter front for me. If you're interested in what that'll be, and that little hint drop, you can just check out frogpants.com. That's where it'll be posted, likely early next week. Uh, I talk about it on other shows, so I won't bore you with it here. But if you are interested in daily content, like you're already listening to the Daily Tech News Show and you already love it, Maybe you'd like a morning show, too, to go with it. Start your day with the morning stream and end it with the Daily Tech News Show. You can find that over at frogpants.com as well. And I am Scott Johnson on Twitter. Thanks for having me. Thanks to everybody who supports us on Patreon. We've had a couple people very nicely write us and say, like, oh, I lost my job. I'm in a financial strait. I had to cancel. I'm really sorry. So help pick them up. If you're out there listening to the show and you've got an extra dollar a month, you're like, well, I can afford a dollar. You can help somebody feel good that they are in a hard time because you picked them up and made sure we stayed funded. Patreon.com slash DTNS. And if you would like a mug similar to this one to drink your coffee out of, try dailytechnewsshow.com slash store, where fine products like this and others are sold. <laughs> If you want to get your email read on the show or perhaps the monthly mailbag of which the next one is coming up pretty soon. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Questions, comments, jokes, we'll take them. We are live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. I believe Justin Robert Young will be along tomorrow. So give him a big warm welcome. We'll talk to you there. <laughs> This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> Pachinga. Yeah, I think that went really good. Me too. Yep. That yes. Good good job. Good good show. Good show, Very good everybody. Show. Yeah. There's so much more to talk about. Uh, I was so I was kind of like mildly nervous i don't know you know sometimes it's just there's there'll be a story where i'm just kind of like oh it's just it's a very it's a very touchy topic i mean um especially when you're involving uh a situation where someone has died is right yeah. Yeah, yeah yes yes also it could have gone so much worse like it could have gotten so yeah, but you know honestly i didn't think it would i think i know all of you and it's not, i don't think you wouldn't any of you no, i don't mean that out. i mean the i mean the shooting <laughs> the, oh, oh you mean the event itself yeah uh, yeah yeah so i'm glad it didn't i'm glad people are you know recovering and all that but i don't know that whole thing yeah i remember remember i know this is old man talk but remember we had that incident at the studio at tech tv and that's where they started putting in security yeah 
It's I Roger, I think you made the best point of 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 all, which is, you know, they've grown to a part where they just cross into a, a large enough amount of people that that statistically going to have you're going to get Yeah. And the reason I say that's cuz I've seen it happen before. I've seen it in fandom. Mm-hmm. Like I remember cosplay circles. There were relatively small niche groups, but as they broaden out, there are a lot of people who started running into issues with body shaming, with uh, harassment. I mean, like a lot of things that didn't used to exist. And it's because the the that particular you know group expanded beyond you know the you know a few tens of thousands into like you know millions of people, and you're invariably going to get a subset of. You know what society has to offer, unfortunately. Yeah, uh, it's true across. Now, the-, the next, the next hurdle. What do we call this show? <sighs> um, do we want to avoid the? I the, think the- we can't avoid it. No, I think we kind of have to name it on the events. Just, yeah, if, just we, try to be as. Yeah, you know. we're not going to have a fun title. That's all. No. Yeah. Well, there really isn't one in the way of for that particular subject yeah i think we're gonna have to come up with one i think um you two shooting aftermath or is that two you know that's not a that's not a bad way to go just no. yeah you just call be yeah Play. like it's not gonna be clever it's yeah. just it is what it is i agree I think that's actually. By the way, I do like tender loop bacon cheddar ranch. <laughs> oh, I, everyone likes that. But uh, on another really, day, that no, would definitely just, be the title. Just because, um, uh, I don't know. I pay attention to dating apps, um, and when they fight with each other, and when they get new features. But it's like a two-second loop in lieu of a photo, right? I can't imagine. I I feel like. Th- now, and this is not fair because I haven't seen one yet, nor have I made one, uh, but I feel like if somebody had one of those, I would like them less. <laughs> well, but then that's good. Then no. It's, it's a weed good. out factor. Oh, I see. You it's know, weed- like, okay, that wouldn't have worked out. But Dodge that's not why Tinder is doing it. They're doing it because they're like, oh, you know, people love loops, right? That's a thing. Well, it's not right? in lieu of the photo. It's in addition. They're actually giving you more photo slots now. So that you don't have to lose any of your existing photos. You can add, I think, up to four more photos, and they can be loops if you want. They don't have to be. Well, okay. It's it's a loop or it's a photo. That's what I'm that's what I meant by that. But you yes. can have you can have both. That's what I'm saying. Right. Damn. Right. Uh, of the slot that might have been a photo, if it's a loop, I would consider that a weed out uh factor. But that's obviously not why Tinder is giving people that option. They're giving I think it's, okay. so like, I'm hey, you know, people love boomerang on Instagram. Right? I have no standing for this, but I'm going to defend Tinder. Uh, I think what they're trying to do, and I'm not saying they're going to succeed, but my reading of what they're trying to do is saying, hey, when somebody puts a photo up, they can put all kinds of glow and brush and filter, and you may not get a real good idea of what this person really looks like, but a loop is going to show them in action. And it's only two seconds. So it could just be like, you know, a little head tilt or something, but you get to see the real person a little more. But there's already video capabilities for that already. That's not an annoying thing. I mean, well, I, like, I, yeah, I, I know. I, I've never yeah. used dating apps. How representative typically are people's photos of their actual selves when you meet them? They're, well, mixed bag, Raj. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, sometimes, I mean, it's, it, listen, it, for the most part, you know, every once in a while I'll be like, God, that's a bad photo. Why would you do that? But most of the time it's like the photos you find most flattering, right? You don't want to misrepresent yourself necessarily. I mean, that's, that's a whole other thing of people who do that, but you, you know, you want someone to be like, oh, that's, that's a good looking person. You know, that's an attractive person. Oh, that person riding the tiger looks like they're going to be a lot of fun. You know, (laughs) (laughs) in fact, maybe a two second tiger riding loop is not the worst idea in the world. If you do that, let's date. Maybe what you'd find is you think that the weed out until you see the loop, you're like, wait a minute. That is an unanticipated clever use yeah. of the loop. Per- yeah, perhaps I'm, I'm being uh, unreasonably dismissive (laughs) of this whole thing. I will get back to you all. All right. Yes. Please report back. (laughs) I mean, how many? There's Tinder. 
There's yeah. Tinder. There's Bumble. There's oh gosh, there's, there's so many. There's there's okay Cupid. There's Match. Uh, there's uh, Blender, oh, but like the third there's app. The I, I, there's they're they're pretty much all app based at this point. I mean, there's yeah. web versions of of this stuff. Yeah, there but are, it's there are literally hundreds, Roger. Hundreds. I mean, there's so many. Well, and there's you know like people who want to like I don't remember the name of it, but it's like. I think it's called Farmers Only. It's like Oh yeah, they made fun of it on uh, Family Guy. Yep. I'm sure they did. But it's you know, it's again, it's sort of like let's try to uh, you know, you know, really get people who you know have something that's like so big in common that that um, you know, or religion, J date, huge, huge yep. in the Jewish e, community. E Harmony used to be that. That used to be an un Yeah, they were a Christian. Although not uh, although not Officially, that was kind of their it thing. Was th those were the undertones, right? Right. I mean, far, I mean, it's funny because uh, FarmersOnly.com is, of course, to hook together people up who are into maybe a farming rural lifestyle. Uh, but uh, Family Guy made fun of it, saying like, even though we don't say it, we're just pretty much white people only. And right after that, FarmersOnly.com, they changed up their commercials to include more people of color. Oh, it was well. Okay. Okay. Well done, Family Guy. But uh, what I was going to say was, I I'm kind of with Sarah on that. I think they're just going. People like gifts. Gifts are cool. Yeah. Repeat. Let's you know. let's add a feature so we seem like we're iterating. Yeah. Well, but, you're taking it that way. They're saying no. That's not why we're doing it. It is always possible that the thing that looks like a crass move has a legitimate reason. Tinder's trying to say it has a legitimate reason. And I think we almost convinced Sarah that it might be a legitimate reason. So I did not say it was crass. I don't find this whole thing crass. I just think it's it's a feature that will, it seems. Um, that will finally get you to a, date that tiger rider. That tiger rider, <laughs> yeah. Two second gift loops, wipe right. Here's Thanks. my question though. Can, uh, I assume they have contact control, right? Not, some guy's not gonna do some pervy thing with a gif, right? Uh, mm, uh, I don't, I, I don't know. Because because Apple's got strict rules on that for their app for well, that. I, 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 well, I sure. think you. I think if you report a photo, it yeah, can yeah. come down pretty quick. There's some pretty good self regulation in that because pretty yeah. photos don't get you responses. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, yeah, and there are rules against it too. Yeah, but pretty sure. photos also make. I it would make if I was on there, I'd be like, ugh, okay, maybe I don't want this. Well, definition of pervy too, right? Well, like yeah. Saying, like if you do something that is vile. No one's going to date you. They're going to report you and your profile gets taken down. So I, I, I'm guessing that doesn't happen very often. It probably happens. But my, my thinking is that they would worry that if people saw too much of that, they would just leave their service. Yeah, I don't think I don't think that's right. the biggest concern. Yeah, I remember. Remember when, I, when they hooked me up on Mash.com for a segment on Call for Help? Oh, so weird? many years ago. So many years ago. And I remember Adam. Remember the booker, Adam? He's like, oh, you got to be really careful, Roger. Uh, a lot. It's like, why? It's like, well, and it's like, from personal experience, I'm not going to speak for the company. He basically said that uh, a lot of. Um, what year was this? Of, Let's just be clear. What year was this? 2003. 2003. Okay. So technically, you have had a dating profile. So 15 years ago. 15 the years ago. Dating apps was. Yeah. Oh, no, it was uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, prostitutes who are using the service as a way to. OK, this is this is a very yeah. old problem because there was a yeah. whole law just passed to try to drive out exactly that kind of thing. Well, and most I, of the most of the legitimate platforms have driven it out a long time ago. I, I will say I've never um, I've never run across a profile, male or female, uh, that uh, appeared to be prostitution. However. I have definitely run across profiles, particularly in the Venice Beach, LA area, where it's clear that this person wants to sell me marijuana, not date me. Ah. Or maybe both. Maybe both. <laughs> Wait, well, so not what's the opening exclusive. line then? And to yeah. and Roger, to your point, I bet there are some of these more niche areas that maybe don't have as large of a user base to self-police. You might you might find that sort of activity more common still. Yeah. I think that's probably true. Plenty of activity. That's plenty of fishes. Plenty of fish. That's plenty another fish. one. Yeah. There's always a, there's plenty <laughs> of fish in the sea. Together. There is People a day. eat fish. What happened yeah. to OK Cupid? Still doing it, right? I'm still in OK Cupid. So. I mean, OK Cupid was, was, that was, that was the, uh, 
It was the industry standard for a while. That was the and then Tinder came months, along yeah. pretty much. And three married guys talk about dating apps. <laughs> no, I've, I, I, I've been on two of them. One of them because of Veronica, but it's uh, mm. not for a while. He's the match. No, not for a while. Uh, married for. I used for to work for a company who was making a site that was a niche dating site, and uh, I hated yeah. every second of it. I hated being there. Wait, what's the one where it isn't dating? It's just activity partners, like where it's just you want to do stuff like catch. Yeah, a I don't remember which one that is. That one sounds uh, creepier to me than, than a regular. Dating. Well, the thing, but the the, the, the premise is kind of cool, right? Because it's like, hey, you know, you know, not everybody wants to just like go to a darkly lit bar and you know, kind of like, mm, mm. like. Uh, you know, choke down a drink and be like, I don't want to be here anymore. Or, you know, or, you know, it's like drinks or coffee, like there's nothing in between. And sometimes people feel more comfortable, like, oh, it's going to be a group of six people going on a hike. Right. And, and maybe one of those people you might be interested in, but it also feels more forced. I don't know. It depends on you. Everybody's different. It's like museum night. Everyone let's get together, go to the museum at night. Yeah, see, I don't group activities are no thank you. Yeah, I don't like it that. depends. It depends on the group. Totally. But group it's activities like, for me with a bunch of strangers are very anxiety inducing. Yeah, I don't like it. You know, like I might have a great time, but I might not. But that's like a date. I don't know. Well, it depends if it has a. Uh, yeah, it really it's, depends. It's all the pain of dating one person times six. Well, no, but you don't have that expectation or the obligation. That's true. It does. It does reduce the. It distributes mm -hmm. it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you can, you know, like you know, test the test the waters by making you know a glib comment here or there and see how it works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Low key comedians trying out the group. Well, hey, that's where you like it's it's always one of the races. You know, come on. I mean, every every group has one, whether it's like an office group or a friend group. Or there's always How that. Do you one, know this, Roger? <laughs> there's always that one person that always tries to be funny, but it's an awkward funny. It's, uh, like, How do you have experience with this? <laughs> yes, I do, and it's not me, Tom. I know what you're I think. To I think. Yes. I think. Admittedly, we're all that person. Yeah, exactly. We got four of them right here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm the funniest, but you guys do pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, I really uh, don't use dating. I don't even use dating apps these days, but I like to keep up on them all. I like to be the resident dating app expert. Nice. I like because it. Because I want everybody to, you know, to find love. And find play. happiness. Pair off we're to find happiness. We're, we're just an activity partner. Go Is horse pick a pair. Ride a tiger. It could be more than a pair, whatever it makes you happy. Exactly. Hey, there are no rules here. That's a great name for an app. Ride more the tiger. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh my. You need a little more excitement in your life? Why don't I you ride the tiger? The show would be depressing. I was wrong. Nope. No, nope. we are. Four people who can turn it around. Yeah, yeah we're we four can, people that make awkward comedy. We can ignore mm -hmm. the elephant <laughs> in the room like the best of them. Okay, uh, we ever. Sit down, elephant. All right. Uh, any final words before I close the stream? No. Uh, thank you all uh, for supporting us. And, uh, and, and and if it's not clear, you know, we were definitely whistling in the dark. Uh, here in this post show, uh, it's it's not a pleasant day. Uh, we hope that everyone involved and affected uh, recovers, uh, and uh, that we don't have to talk about something like this again. Yeah, that'd be great. Amen. See you guys tomorrow. Bye bye. See you tomorrow.